open. If you've got your Bibles, young people, you may be in the living room, and I'm not sure where everybody's at right now. I've been home before on one of these nights where we've got a chance to watch online, and it's a little different for sure, but if you want to grab your Bible, young people, I don't know if you've got a Bible bag or something uh, in the room, but grab your Bibles, gather it around. We're going to spend just a few minutes in the Word of God tonight, and I hope it'll be encouraged to all of us. This is different. It certainly is. We don't get a chance to do this very often, and you don't get to see what I see here, which is pretty much an empty audit- auditorium here. Uh, but there's a, uh, there's a big redhead in our midst here tonight, so uh, you haven't got a chance to see him yet, but uh, Jeff Ludka is home, and I won't have him run up here and wave to you, but uh, we'll, have, we'll post a picture of him here at the end with him sitting here with his red socks uh, church-approved attire tonight. So, uh, but it's been good to see him. So say hi to Jeff on the comments below. Uh, but we're going to be in Romans 8 tonight, and Romans is a tremendous portion of Scripture. Uh, I think you're aware of that. I think most of you here probably have memorized a lot of uh, Romans 8. Many of these verses so familiar, so helpful, so encouraging. And uh, really, when we come to the Word of God, we're to come to it seeking to hear from God, and seeking to be encouraged. Now, Romans 8, let's just briefly mention a couple of verses here that you've probably, um, perhaps some of, some of these are your life verses. Verse 28, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God. What an awesome verse, right? Verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, verse 37, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And I'm sure that uh, many of you have probably pulled those verses out from time to time and, and, uh, and used them in different s- situations, and that's perfectly appropriate to do. These verses can stand on their own. They're powerful verses with a tremendous amount of truth in them, on them on, alone, by themselves. But when you take the whole of Romans 8 together, it was given to us, these ideas, these truths that we're going to explore tonight, were truly given to the Christians in the city of Rome and to each of us, to encourage us, to found us in our faith. The facts of our faith was supposed to bring strength and encouragement to us in our times of need. It was truly meant to bring encouragement into our lives in the midst of chaos. Certainly there was chaos in Rome, in cir- circumstantially. In, this, in the story that was being written there, the story that we look back on in the first century, it was a tumultuous time. And right in the midst of that, they were receiving a letter from the Apostle Paul with these truths that were meant to encourage them and help them. Uh, I think for each of us, this has been, it's been different, right? As we look back, and you've probably heard so much about, I mean, all we've been talking about is the coronavirus and COVID-19, almost, uh, almost too much, honestly. And it's just dominated our conversations and our way of thinking and It certainly isn't something to minimize. It certainly has been a big deal and is impacting a lot of people. I spoke to my brother-in-law, as uh, Pastor John mentioned, uh, who's not in Peru right now. They just got back on furlough, but just hearing about Pastor Henry, and he's down there, one of the pastors of that church. And um, here, my my brother-in-law, who's a missionary there, is saying, I just don't know where they're going to find support for even him uh, now that the church isn't meeting. And, And many of those people, the struggles that would be real in talking to Peru Uh, That's not to be minimized. It certainly is a difficult situation, and that's true in some elements here in the States, and there's a lot of uncertainty. I was on the, actually I wasn't on the phone, I was texting with someone who's not a part of our church but uh, today, and his response to me was, a lot of people are afraid, and uh, certainly we've seen that. You can't, you go to the headlines and CNN or Fox News and you see what's going on in the world right now, and it seems like since Middle of last week, about this time last week to today, it's just been hourly. Things have been changing, and it's, uh, it's new territory for most of us. I spoke to Miss Lily this week, and uh, she is a, a, a beautiful, elegant, older lady. She's above the age of 80, we'll say that much. And, uh, but she said to me, she said, Michael, I've never seen anything like this. In all my life, I've never seen anything like this. And in my 34 years, I'd say the same. I've, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, but we know. And we know this for sure, that something like this is going to uh, it's gonna go through. I think the president said it's going to wash through, right? And there will be a point in the future when we look back on this and we'll say, uh, I remember those days when we did this and we did that. And, uh, you know, there may be some, some things that are remnants that hold forward from this. Uh, we don't really know, but we certainly know uh, we will get through this. It will wash through. 
And we're also aware that this isn't really new. Uh, things like this. Uh, we have certainly had struggle, whether it's individually or personally or family or uh, in a certain areas of the country. We've had struggles that have consumed our thinking in the past. We're in one right now. And we'll certainly see one in the future. Man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. It's just part of our reality. It's part of being human. We see these things. We approach these things. And we prayed for Don here a few minutes ago. And uh, in all reality, what we're dealing with right now uh, pales in comparison uh, to what he's dealing with. And we're praying for him. believe God's going to do some big things. Uh, But there's certainly more serious things than even what we're dealing with with this virus and what it's doing in our country today. So we're aware that these things are happening. And I'm thankful as I've been observing and watching online and the people I've spoken with, uh, this church is responding in faith in moments of crisis. When other people are responding in fear, we've seen our people stepping forward in faith. And that's just not this church. It's the body of Christ, uh, not just here in this country, but around the world. The testimonies of faith in times of struggle. Uh, Living out our faith when it's our moment and our opportunity to do that in the midst of a fearful world. And that's exciting to see. But we need encouraged. And from time to time, we as Christians, whether it's today in this moment or to be in the next moment of our life, we have to find something that grounds us. We have to find the facts of our faith and remember these things and be grounded in them to sustain us and bring stability in difficult times. And Romans chapter 8, maybe as eloquently as any portion of Scripture outlines for us the facts of our faith in which we find stability in times of struggle. You know, I think for each of us, when we deal with something difficult, we're kind of, I mean, not even difficult, just normalcies of life, really. We deal with things on kind of two levels. One is emotionally. We're emotionally driven people. We tend to react to things. I've told my wife many times, hey, this is a great day. I'm excited about today. And then there's been other days when I've had a bad attitude and I uh, thought, hey, it wasn't that great of a day. Like emotional, right? We're emotional people. We ride the waves of our emotions. Uh, so we're emotional. Even in spiritual things at times. You've probably been there with me where you've said, you know, I kind of, not that I feel spiritual today, but you know, like, you know, I'm just kind of connecting today. You know, I, I'm, I'm, my Bible reading was good. I, um, my conversations with others, I, I feel spiritual today. And then other days when we don't feel so spiritual, right? We're emotional people. So on an emotional level, we tend to ride the waves uh, often. And then also, maybe the second way that we tend to be kind of our, our day-to-day as happens and how we tend to be grounded or not so grounded has to do with our circumstances. Uh, on positive days, you know, we're, we're doing really well. We're high that day. We're excited about things. Uh, even in, the, in church-related things. Uh, for our teenagers that went off to a camp making decisions for Christ at the camp and just being excited about things. And we know that. We know what excitement looks like. And in those moments when things are going well, it happens, right? Something happens. A circumstance changes. We seem to just be smacked with something. And we go uh, from high to low. Isn't it amazing how quickly Christians, ourselves, myself, yourself, we tend to lose our joy by circumstances that are happening in our lives? So we, we have to deal with these things, our emotions, because we're emotional people, and our circumstances, because we tend to ride these circumstances in our life. That's how we live. But the truth of Scripture and the truths of Romans 8 and God's plan for us is that we would find in the truth of our identity in Him His love for us, His control over our circumstances, His presence in our life, that we would be able to live in the midst of chaos circumstantially and what would seem to bring about emotional chaos and we would be able to find stability and steadiness and peace that is not riding the constant wave of emotions and circumstances but is grounded and is steady. Romans chapter 8 brings us to these truths, the these truths of Romans chapter 8 verse 31, the these things that Paul spoke to that can ground us in the middle of difficult times. Before I list those for you, and we'll do it briefly tonight, before we work through that list, I'd like you to remember, we'll even put it to you in a bit of a rhyme so you can kind of hopefully hold this and be able to, to remember this as you go forward this week. But before I do so, I think it'll help us if we just focus for one second on who these people that was getting this book, receiving this letter were, all right? So think with me for just a second. First century Rome, the Roman Christians, the church in the city of Rome, The church in the city of Rome would have been 
uh, in a lot of ways, made up of individuals that, that, that are not that much different than we are, right? So in, in some ways, they had a lot in common with us. We would just assume that many of them were married. Those of you that are married, that are listening to this live stream, you know about the joys and the struggles of married life. So would they, right? Uh, many of us uh, have children, or we have parents, young people, right? So we know what families are like, and so did they. They knew about that. So those things are in common. They would have also known um, about sickness, as we know about sickness. They would have known that. They would have dealt with it, just the same way that we do, common things. They would have dealt with financial stress, certainly. They would have, in many ways, if you know their story. And so do we, in many ways. Uh, really, they would have even known about um, just r relational drama, family drama, extended family drama. That would have existed in their environment, too. A lot of the common things about just being human, we have those in common. But here's the point. There's a lot about the first century Christians that is uncommon to us, even in times like this, even in difficult times that we're currently facing. Let me remind you for a minute, these Christians in first century Rome, Rome was not exactly a safe place, if you know anything about your history books, was not exactly a safe place for Christians. I don't mean to scare you young people at all, but it was a, a dangerous place if you were a Christian. You could lose uh, your home. You, if you were a Christian, you, you, you could lose your home, you could lose your job, and many, many, many lost their lives just simply for being a Christian. Nero, the emperor at that time, was a crazy man, and he hated Christians, and he was even known, and don't let this frighten you, but he was even known to take Christians and and uh, burn them in his garden as lamplight for his gardens. Gruesome things, but those things were happening if you were a Christian. Uh, gladiators in Colosseums uh, taking the lives of many, many Christians. It was a dangerous thing to be a Christian in that setting. Here's my point. If Paul was writing to the first century Christians a letter, and in it he intended them to examine the facts of their faith, and to step forward with courage, and to step forward with strength and stability. And he intended them to receive encouragement through it. And they were encouraged. If it was sufficient for them in their moment, then it is sufficient for us in our moment. The truths of who we are in Christ, our identity, and his love for us. So let's just take a moment and see what these are. All right, look with me in verse 1 of Romans Chapter 8, the source of the believer's encouragement. Number one is found is we are encouraged because we are not condemned. Let's think for just a minute about what it means to be a Christian that we find here. Verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. May I remind you this evening, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, your sins are forgiven. You are redeemed. Once a child of hell, now you are a child of God. We have been forgiven. Once spiritually dead, we're now alive. Once outcast, now children, sons and daughters of the living God, we have been redeemed. When the world smacks you in the face, when the world disappoints you, step back for a moment. Examine your position in Christ and account yourself as a child of God. You've been redeemed. We are not condemned. God loves us. He died for us. We've been given this salvation in Christ. Verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Think for a second about that. What Scripture is saying here is the law... Uh, calls me, Michael Foreman, and all of us guilty. The law says, here's what you're to be. And I fail to be that, right? It, it shows, it proves to me that I'm a sinner, that I've missed the mark of God's perfection, that I'm on the outside looking in. God is perfect and I am not. It proves my guilt. My sin, Scripture says, for the wages of sin is death, but it does not end there. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus hath made me free. I stand in need of a Savior, and in Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross on my behalf, we have been redeemed, children of God, set free. 
It says here in verse 3, for, the law could, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. You see, we try, and through, many people try really hard through just living a good life to please God, but we fail. Through trying to do the law, we fail. Verse 3 goes on to say, because, but since it's failed, God made a way. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned, condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Through Christ, we have been made righteous. We are not condemned. The key here is we are not condemned, not by human effort, not through trying to be good, but we are not condemned because of Jesus Christ. No more a failure. We have been forgiven. You know, sometimes in my life, and I don't know if this is you, but this is certainly me, at times, and, and it may kind of shock you, but think for a second to see, maybe it's true in your own life. Uh, sometimes I think we live like we've gotten over our salvation. What I mean by that is not that we, have, that we think we're not saved anymore, that we're not a child of God, but we get over the excitement and the joy and the zeal of being a child of God. You've been around a new believer, someone who's just come to faith in Jesus Christ and seen that excitement and that joy. And it's, it's, it's almost, we're almost envious of it. You know, I want that again. I want that joy. And I wonder if it's true in your life, and often it's true in mine, and, and sometimes when I'm riding these roller coasters, it's very evident. I live out in a practical way, like I've gotten over the salvation I've, I've received. In those moments, go back to the truths of the salvation we received, our utter hopelessness, and God's tremendous love and sacrifice to bring us into his family. And may we not live that way. But the truth is we can be encouraged because we are not condemned. Secondly, we can be encouraged today, and this is really helpful. This is a a source of so much of our discouragement, but we can be encouraged today because we do not have to sin. Uh, Paul goes on to say that. Not only are we not condemned, but but we don't have to sin. In verses 8 through verses 17, he really, he outlines for us that we're not obligated to sin anymore. Now, we certainly are still going to struggle. We have the flesh uh, with the Spirit of God has come to indwell us. We have a new nature, but we're still, we're still working to yield to the Spirit of God and, and trying to put off the old man and put on the new, new man as we yield to God's Spirit in us and as we draw near to Him. And we still deal with this awful sin nature, and it brings so much ruin and discouragement in our lives. Bad choices, bad attitudes, wrong actions, harsh words in marriage, disobedience to parents that just brings difficulty and strain on relationships, Uh, financial problems that come about because of our lack of discipline. Uh, All these things that plague us and hurt us. And so often we we just want to overcome these habitual sins in our lives of attitudes and actions, and, and it brings so much discouragement. But the truths of Scripture and the truth of the presence of God in our life and the truth of of this salvation that we possess is that we do not have to sin. That God by His Spirit is renewing us. That God by His Spirit is helping us to bring life and to put to death the old man and to bring life to the new man. That's exactly what Scripture says. In verse 12 it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Back in verse 11, Scripture tells us that the Spirit brought life to raise Christ from the dead. The Spirit which indwells us brings life to bring newness of life and to to bring about the new man and the formation of of God's work and bring about spiritual life in our hearts. But it's also there to bring to death the flesh in our lives. This, think for a second here on this idea of mortify. Well, what does that mean? Well, that just simply means to put to death. We're to mortify. We're to put to, put to death our sinful attitudes and actions. But don't miss this. We often say in our own lives, you know, I, I want to please God, and I, I'm, so I'm going to kill this thing that's been plaguing me. I, I don't want to have that attitude. I don't want to act that way. I don't want to lash out with my temper. Or maybe it's, a, maybe it's an action in our life that, that we just want to die and we want to kill it and we try and we fail and we try and we fail and we try and we fail. Because we try and we fail without yielding and running to and seeking the presence of the enabler, the one who brings life and the one who puts to death. What does it say here? It says, 
If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, through the Spirit, do put to death, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You see, the key is the presence and the help of Christ. Nineteen times the Holy Spirit is mentioned in this little, this chapter. Because at the key of all of our encouragement and the key of all of our success, success is not from us trying to be good Christians. It's from us seeking the presence of Christ and seeking the help of the Holy Spirit and drawing near to Him whereby He transforms us into the image of God. You see, if you're struggling today, then run to Jesus. Run to the help of His Spirit. Draw nigh unto God, and He promises He'll draw nigh unto you. Put forth your effort, but fall on your face in, in, in humility before God and say, I need your help, Lord. Help me in my moment of weakness. You see, God, by His Spirit, brings us to a place where we don't have to sin. So be encouraged today. We are not condemned. Be encouraged today. We don't have to sin. Number three, be encouraged today, believer. He is coming again. Scripture here brings out our understanding of the presence, the coming presence of Christ. You know the hymn, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through, right? Well, that's a reality. When the weight of this world gets too much for us, remember this is not our final destination. Uh, we're not living for this world. We have to live in it. We have to do business here. We've got to conduct our lives here. But there is more to love. There is more to the life we live than what is right in front of us. You see, we have the Spirit working in us, bringing a little heaven to earth. And then we have a future eternity with God forever. An eternity to spend with God in heaven. Sometimes we're so narrow-sighted that it brings discouragement when this world fails us. But when we look at the big picture, that this is just a moment, a blinking of the eye, and eternity lies in front of us, be encouraged. He's coming again. What's he say in verse 18? For I reckon that the sufferings, listen to this, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The, the, the sufferings of these days are not even, don't even begin to compare with all God intends and wants to do in our lives today and for eternity. Verse, eight, verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in, in pain together until now. And we've seen that. We live in a world that's full of trouble. We're in it now. We'll be in it tomorrow. Verse 25, But... If we hope in the certainty, right? That's what this hope is. If we look with certainty for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. There's coming a day when no heartaches shall come, right? No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. You know, that's, that's our future. That's our hope. Be encouraged that he is coming Again, be inspired today. Be encouraged that you are not condemned. Be encouraged today that you don't have to sin. Be encouraged today. He is coming again. But you might be thinking and saying, that's great, but what about now? <laughs> sure, he's coming again. And, and I'm looking forward to that. I really am, Michael. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But what about now? Romans 8, God by his spirit speaks right into the now. So here's, here's what we can bank on now. Be encouraged today. You're not condemned. Be encouraged today. You don't have to sin. Be encouraged today. He's coming again. But until then, He is with us. He is with me. His presence is real and abiding. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not that we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He's saying here, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Uh, even when we don't know how to pray, when we're so discouraged in the moment and we don't even know what to say, God by His Spirit prays for us. 
He's our advocate. He lifts up those prayers, the rightful prayers to the throne of God, and, and He takes those needs and our weakness before God. He's, our, he's with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. His presence, the promise of His presence, the reality of His presence is just as real today at this moment as it was for the Christians in the catacombs in Rome in the first century. It's just as real and as present as it was for the Apostle John when he laid his head on the chest of the very Christ, on the body, the body of the actual Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Just as real as he was to the first century Christians, just as, he, as he real as he was to the apostles, he wants to be that to us. He offers that to us. He is with us. He is present. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Believer, God is with you. When the cares of this world get heavy, when you start to feel lonely, when you're discouraged about what the future may hold, be encouraged. God is with you. He's in front of you. He's around you. He knows your future. He's leading you into green pastures of his provision. He's guiding you to still waters of his peace and his comfort. He is present. He is with you. Not only can we be encouraged that he is with us, but we can be encouraged because he is for us. Verse 31 of Romans chapter 8 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us. Us. He is for us. The Almighty God of the universe is on our side and has our best in mind at all times. What does verse 28 say? And we know that all these things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. He's working things together. All these things. All these things. All these things together for our good. Today, tomorrow, he's in control, he's powerful, and he's present, and he is operating in the midst of the chaos for us. As child, as children of God, he's for us. He didn't just say that, but he proved it. Look down at verse 32. Verse 32 says, He that spared not his own son... He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him so freely give us all things? Also freely give us all things. He that spared not his own son. He didn't just say he loved us. He didn't just say he was for us, but he proved it. By leaving heaven's glory and coming to earth and living a sinless life and dying a sacrificial death to be our advocate and our savior and our answer in our time of need. He is for us. You can bank on it. We can be encouraged today because we are not condemned. We can be encouraged today because we don't have to sin. We can be encouraged today because He's coming again. But until then, He is with us. He is for us. And I want you to see this because most profound of all these truths is this final truth in Romans chapter 8. And that's that he loves us. He is with us. He is for us. And He will always love us. He will always love me. And He will always love you. Look at verse 35 of Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Shall distress? No. Shall persecution? No. How about famine or nakedness? No, nope, not those either. Maybe peril or sword? No. Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. He loves you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. He is with you. 
He is for you, and he will always love you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for a friend. And Jesus Christ proved that love for you and for me when he laid down his life at Calvary. He has loved you and me with an everlasting love. Before time began, he knew you and all of your weakness and all of your wreckage and all of your sin and he still chose to love you. He loves you. He's with you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. In closing tonight, let me ask you the question that Scripture posed to us at the very beginning of our message. And that's the question from Romans 8.31. In light of all of the facts of our faith that Paul brings to our attention, in light of all of this, in the middle of the chaos that was true in the first century church and that is true in the 21st century church today, in the moment of our chaos, what shall we say then to these things? Will we respond to God in the moments of our struggle? Planted in the facts of God's love, of His redemption, of our position as a son and a daughter of Christ, in the presence of His love, the power of His hand? Will we respond to the chaos with faith? Or will we choose to reject what is factual about our faith and respond in fear? We have a choice. The first century Christians had a choice in the moments of their chaos. If you went today to those catacombs in the city of Rome, I wouldn't suggest going there now. You probably couldn't get there now if you wanted to. I wouldn't suggest you go in there now. But if you were to go to those catacombs in the city of Rome and go into those 600 miles of tunnels underneath the city of Rome where the Christians went, you would still find graffiti that did not speak to depressed Christians, overwhelmed Christians, hopeless Christians. You would, have seen, you would see the exact opposite. You would see graffiti that would depict a joyful, celebrating, triumphant, encouraged church because they took the truth, the facts of their faith, and they remembered them. So on Monday morning, or Thursday morning, or Friday afternoon, when homeschooling gets a little overwhelming, right, Mom? Uh, perhaps when you get a, a message, we don't know what lies ahead, saying, Right now, your jobs are not happening, and we'll, we're going to figure out how we're going to pay you. We're not really sure about this. Uh, if you get a message saying someone you know is sick, or this all passes, and down the road, you get a phone call from a doctor that the, the test didn't come back well, and you're dealing with cancer now. Whatever lies ahead, for we know there will be chaos in our future, today and in the future. Will we pull out of our back pocket the facts that we as believers are not condemned, that we don't have to sin, that He's coming again, but until then, He is with us, He is for us, and He will always love us. I hope today that that truth will, will rest in our hearts and that we'll be encouraged Christians as we remember the presence and love of God. So be encouraged today. One more time. You are not condemned. You don't have to sin. He's coming again. But until then, He is with you. He is for you. And He will always love you. Lord, help us tonight to remember these things. Help us to look at the these things of our circumstances and respond how the Apostle Paul did Nay, in all of those things, I am, we are more than conquerors through Christ. Lord, help us to respond with that truth as victorious Christians. Thank you for what we possess in this salvation you've given us. And may we be encouraged for it. 
We love you and pray these things in thy name. Amen. Before we close our